I'm going to make a couple of brief comments and then let these guys um, describe the work that they have done, because it's their work. And um, I merely prodded them along the way to do the work. So this, uh, these two projects, um, SAML Shibboleth integration with Open edX and our edX as an LTI tool provider projects both came out of the Campus Applications Working Group, which I mentioned this morning, as a group of people who've been meeting periodically for more than a year to talk about the kinds of projects and uh, motivators that um, prompt discussion of how to do a better job on campus um, using open edX as a part of the solution, right? Not the exclusive solution, but you know, integrating with a whole bunch of other applications and, and campus uh, systems to create a good experience for on-campus learners. So these two projects came, up, came out of that working group. There are many, many participants. It's still an open group, and we are moving on to the very lofty goal of trying to figure out content reuse. Ooh big, scary, and there's a lot there. So we are going to be um, continuing, and if anybody's interested, you can just contact me and uh, get involved. So without further ado, Braid McDonald is going to start us off with um, SSO, third-party authentication um, with edX. Thanks, Beth. Uh, is this working? OK. Uh, so yeah, I'm Braden McDonald. I'm part of OpenCraft. And this summer, I was the lead developer of the new SSO features that are in the Cypress release. Um, that lets students use single sign-on to log in with their campus credentials into edX. So I just wanted to start with talking about how it works and what it looks like for a student. And uh, to start, I'll talk about SAML and Shibboleth. SAML is the technology we're using to enable this new functionality, and it stands for Security Assertion Markup Language. And we implemented SAML 2.0, which is an OASIS standard that was formalized 10 years ago. So it's been a standard for quite a while and is very widely used, well-established, secure, and solid. And Shibboleth, which you'll hear a lot, is an open source server, a software package that implements the SAML protocol. And SAML is a way of using XML to securely exchange authorization and authentication information. So this is the technology uh, that you can use to integrate your campus systems with edX. And as an aside, um, the word shibboleth means anything that you can use to distinguish an in-group from an out-group. So this is a famous example of a shibboleth. This is the doors of Durin. And a speak friend and enter is uh, an example of a shibboleth, if you are familiar with this story. So let's take a look at how this looks from a student's perspective. On the login form on Cypress, you can enable this new button that you see here, Use Institution and Campus Credentials. And so the existing third-party auth is right above it. That's the Facebook and Google button. And now there's this new button, Use My Campus Credentials. So students will click on that. And then they'll see this Where Are You From page. And they can choose their university from the list. Um, you can have only one university if you want, and it will be right on the registration form that you just saw. Or you can now have this big, massive list of as many universities as you'd like to add to your Open edX instance. So the student would then click on, say, Caprica University. And they'll get redirected to their university's login page. So here, a uh, student will just enter their username and password and click through. And then behind the scenes, something like this gets sent through their browser to the Open edX server. And we decode that to get a bunch of XML, which is encrypted, so only the edX server can read it. And then we decrypt that further, and we get one of these. Uh, I like to think of them as business cards. So it's like a business card for that student, and it lists information about the student. So it'll have, in this case, first name, last name, full name, uh, email, and username. And um, just like business cards can vary from one person to another, and there's no real standard for business cards, different schools can include different information on their SAML business cards that are coming from uh, one school or another. So for example, UBC, who we've been working with, uh, for privacy reasons, they basically only send us one number. And that's a unique identifier for that student. 
um, but they don't send across the student's name or anything else. So each school can choose what sort of information they want to put on the business card that is sent to the Open edX server. And so once the server has processed that, it will display this registration form to the student. And any information that was on the business card, like the student's name, uh, email address, et cetera, will already be filled out on the form. And the student just has to finish the rest of it, um, which may be nothing else, or it may be whatever fields your instance is set to require. And then they click Create Account. And ta-da, now they're enrolled as a student, and they can use the dashboard and start learning with edX. So they never had to set a uh, password for edX, and they just used their university credentials the whole time. Now, say they log out, and then they come back. They'll see this login screen, which is slightly different than the registration page. And again, there's this new button, log in with my institution or campus credentials. So you'll just click on that, choose your university. And if you're already logged in, you won't even have to do this step. But if you're not logged into your university, you'll have to enter your username and password again. And then it'll take you back to the home page, and you're ready to keep learning. So that's how it looks from a student's perspective. And now I wanted to talk a bit about how we implemented this on the platform and some lessons learned. So to start with, um, we took the design stories from edX. Uh, they had uh, like end goals of how we wanted this to look. And then I converted those into technical goals for how we were going to implement this. And the first technical goal was to integrate the Shibboleth support with the third-party auth module. And third-party auth is the part that was contributed by Google and John Cox. And it's what lets you do Facebook and Google and LinkedIn logins. And right now in the edX platform, there's like six or seven different ways to log users in. There's like Shibboleth, HTTPS, third-party auth, mobile, and a whole bunch. So one of the goals that I had for this was to integrate it with third-party auth to reduce the number of disparate ways of logging users in. Uh, the second technical goal was we wanted to be able to support many different Shibboleth uh, partners, not just on that login screen that you saw, but also from an administration perspective. We wanted to keep it fairly easy to add new providers. And with the existing third-party auth module, if you wanted to add new providers in addition to the three that come with edX, you had to write a bunch of code each time for each new provider. And so the goal with this was to be able to add new providers with just making configuration changes and not having to write any new code each time. Uh, we also wanted to allow deep links to edX Edge that indicate a preferred institutional login. So what that means is, if I'm a prof at UBC, I can say, hey class, remember to do this exercise here, and I can give a link to my class. And when they click on that link, instead of taking them to the generic edX login page, if they're not logged in, it will give them a specific, uh, UBC specific page. So it will say, would you like to log in now with your UBC credentials? And then they can say yes, and they enter their UBC password, and then they're taken directly to that part of the course content that I linked to. So it creates a more branded and streamlined experience for students when you're using uh, blended learning, especially. And then we wanted to remove the legacy Shibboleth implementation, or at least be able to down the road. There was already Shibboleth support in edX platform, but it required that you run Apache and the Shibboleth software. So you had to use a slightly different stack than everyone else who's using edX. And because it was a third-party software, it wasn't nearly as tightly integrated as the new Shibboleth functionality could be. So based on those technical goals, I put together a plan. I did a whole bunch of discovery reading through code and looking at how things uh, were implemented so far and different options for software we could leverage to implement this. And then I wrote up a technical spec and posted it on the mailing list. And this was 
part of the transition for edX in moving architecture council reviews from like weekly meetings to um, online reviews. So the spec was just posted publicly and we got lots of great feedback from different people. And people were generally really supportive of the direction we were going. Uh, but there were, a lot, there were some little issues that people had and uh, those suggestions were really helpful to me. So I made a bunch of revisions based on all that input and then we declared it a plan ready to go and start developing. One of the stories I want to tell about this briefly was about all the open source collaboration that happened. Um, to implement this, we were of course building on the third party auth module which was contributed by Google and John Cox and John was very helpful. Uh, I got to speak with him a few times and he gave me some advice about implementing this. Um, we also leveraged the Python social auth module that is behind third party auth and it's made by this guy Matthias Aguirre who was also really helpful. I wrote a SAML plugin for Python social auth and contributed it to his project and he helped us um, incorporate that into his software and issued a new release for us so that we were able to use the upstream version and we didn't have to use a fork. Similar thing with Python SAML. Um, this is our implementation of SAML and it's made by this company called OneLogin and this guy is Sixto Martin. And he was also hugely helpful in accepting contributions from us and uh, he also put out a new release so we were able to use his upstream version and didn't have to fork anything. And then I also want to mention TestShib. Um, Internet2 is the company that makes uh, the Shibboleth software and they have this great website called TestShib that was invaluable for us in making sure that the implementation complied with all the SAML standards and was actually working. So yeah, that collaboration was really helpful during development and we wouldn't have been able to do uh, a, a third of this work, a third as much work without all these great open source partners. I'm gonna skip this one for time constraints but you can ask me the story of Cry9 later which is very interesting. Um, I also wanna talk about our university partners. Um, we worked with UBC a lot and also U, uh, UC Berkeley and Georgetown. Um, they all helped us test the new Shibboleth implementation and basically each time we tested with a new university we found a new set of bugs. Uh, part of the thing with SAML and Shibboleth is that the specification leaves a huge leeway in how you implement it and in what sort of settings you use. So we found that each time we worked with a new university they had some setting that wasn't quite compatible with our implementation. So. These guys were super helpful in working out the kinks and making sure that our end solution was going to work for as many schools as possible. Um, Georgetown was the only one where we just flicked the switch and it actually worked, so that was a little bit gratifying. I also want to talk about some of the mistakes I made because that's where we learned the best. Um, one was scheduling reviews. I didn't give heads up to some of the teams that needed to review some of my PRs, like the UX team, and so they were suddenly caught with this big pull request from me, and it's like, hey, we need a UX review on this, and uh, luckily they were able to scramble and help make sure we met our deadlines, but um, I needed to give them more of a heads up, so that was a good lesson for me to make sure I know all the different teams that are going to be, need to be involved in reviewing the PR. Uh, before I post it and give them as much notice as possible. And Celery Beat, so during the technical uh, spec that I posted, I was getting all this great feedback from people. Someone who's very influential at edX came to me, or posted a comment on there and is like, oh, if you need to regularly run this process to update the SAML metadata, you should use Celery Beat. So I'm like, okay, that sounds cool. And so I implemented it that way. And then when it came time to deploy, the DevOps guys got to me and were like, Celery Beat, oh, we don't want that on our stack. Uh, so it was a good lesson to me to check with the DevOps guys before I uh, add new features or new stack issues. And um, storing secrets in the database, I, made, I got my first CVE ticket for a security issue in code that I wrote by storing some 
private, like the private keys in the database, which is not an inherent security flaw, but it creates more, uh, oops, more of a window for exposure if your database is compromised. So we released a patch afterwards that lets you store uh, the private keys in a more secure location. And we, I dropped support for OAuth 1 because I just kind of assumed, oh, nobody's using OAuth 1, everyone's on OAuth 2. And then we got at least one guy wrote to us and said that they're still using Twitter uh, for third-party auth login, and that requires OAuth 1. So I had to do a, a patch after we'd released this to add OAuth 1 support as well. So that was my bad for not reaching out to the community and checking, you know, is this actually used before I went and nuked it. And Cry9 email validation, I'll have to skip over that, but it's an ongoing issue. Uh, if people register and go through a certain series of steps, then they can't log into their account. But we're working on a fix for that. So how do you get this? Um, I'm not going to go through that now in my talk, but Allison, there she is, has written awesome documentation for this. And you can get it at docs.edx.org and then click through a series of links. And I also made this short URL for you. So if you just go to bit.ly slash cypress SSO setup, you can uh, get those docs and they walk you through the whole process of setting it up. And last thing to mention, if you run into any trouble, uh, just search edX code. Someone else might have had the issue beforehand. And if not, just post a new post. And someone, probably me, will be happy to help you out and get that sorted. If you have any questions, um, there's a whole bunch of things I didn't cover. Here's some suggested questions. Feel free to uh, get me at the end of this. I'm going to turn it over to Phil now. And uh, yeah, so I'll take questions at the end. Thanks. All right. So. Um, So I'm going to be doing the second half of this presentation. This is on a, a somewhat unrelated project that came out of the same working group. So it's kind of a context shift without a handbrake here. So um, let me kind of switch over. So what I'm going to talk about is enabling edX to work as an LTI provider. Um, oh, sorry. Is this better? So um, the reason we're doing this work in the first place, uh, Canvas, uh, Harvard has a couple of uh, platforms that we use on campus and beyond. Um, I don't know whether you can actually read any of this, but um, on campus we almost exclusively use Canvas. I know that some other uh, institutions are, are using this. Um, we have roughly 2,000 courses uh, per semester that are running in this, and it's beginning to stabilize now. It's going to go up slightly as we, we kind of get the migration finished up. Um, on the other hand, we use edX for our uh, other learning experiences. So obviously we have a lot of MOOCs that come out through HarvardX that are published on edX.org. We also have a handful of courses that run off Edge. Um, and up until last semester, the way that's been done has been essentially that um, students have two sets of credentials. They log into Canvas for most of their stuff and then they go off to the Edge server for the, uh, the more kind of interactive content. Um, but really, the big thing that we had is that we want to be able to share our content. So I know HarvardX have invested a huge amount of money in producing professional-grade videos and putting together these really interesting assignments. And the fact that they're now saying, well, we put all this work in, so can we use this locally for our own students as well as in the MOOC? So that was kind of setting the scene here. We needed to find some way of integrating the two platforms so that we could, we could share content. So the way we decided to go was using the LTI standard. Now, um, this time last year, or uh, almost last year when it was a whole lot colder, um, we had a talk at the last Open edX conference about um, LTI and how we might want to use LTI and edX. Um, so LTI is a, it's a very widely accepted standard now. In fact, it's, it's pretty much the only real standard for um, launching and sharing L uh, educational tools. Um, the latest version of it is version 2. Uh, we're focusing our efforts on an older version, version 1.1, partly because it's much more widely adopted and partly because it's a, a kind of technically simpler thing to, to bite off. Um, 
So I don't want to go too deeply into the, um, the details of LTI, but essentially it's a, it's a network-based protocol. Everything's done over HTTP, JSON, um, you know, fairly common standards. Um, and there's two halves to it, as you know, most network protocols would have. You have the LTI provider, which is the component that basically runs some kind of educational learning tool, with some kind of content. And then there's the LTI consumer, which uh, takes that content and embeds it. So right now, um, edX, or as of this time last year, edX is, was an LTI consumer, has been an LTI consumer for some time, which means that you can take LTI tools that were developed elsewhere and you can plug them into edX so that uh, you, know, you can use this content in your courses without having to actually build it into the platform. Um, what we wanted to do was flip that and say we have all this content that lives on edX, we want to use it on campus, uh, and so we want to turn edX into an LTI provider so that we can basically just plug the edX content right into Canvas. Um, and so that's what we've done. Basically, um, last January or so, uh, we started working on a, a spec. We've been talking about uh, requirements for, for quite some time before that. We put together a, a technical spec um, with details of exactly what we're going to be implementing, posted it on the mailing list. We got generally pretty good feedback. Um, and then basically we went ahead with, uh, with that design. So it took about six months or so to do the full implementation. It's uh, in the open edX source now. Uh, this semester we're piloting with three courses in Harvard. Um, I know that UBC is piloting with seven courses. Five. Five. Um, so UBC is piloting with other courses. The interesting thing here is that Harvard is using Canvas, UBC is using Blackboard. So we now have an existence proof in the two big uh, LTI consumers. Uh, anyone who wants to use it against a different consumer, so we should talk about that. I mean, it feels like after one and two, number three should be easy, but we'll never know. Um, for those of you who read the, uh, the technical spec, which was 10 pages of dense technical detail that went out to the mailing list, uh, we've basically implemented all the stuff that we, uh, we intended to going in um, with one major extra feature that I'll get to at the end. But um, it was meant to be kind of an MVP of the, the basic stuff that we've been asked for, um, plus a few extra little details that we thought would come in useful over time. Um, and so we're pretty happy now with the way that that's been implemented. So I don't know quite, uh, quite how illuminating that is. You may have to take my word for it. What you're seeing here is uh, this is our, our Canvas site. Um, the purple at the top and then the left-hand sidebar here, that's all Canvas. That's the, the kind of native Canvas UI. Then embedded in the, the center here is edX content. So what you're actually looking at here are two separate services that are running. Canvas, which is providing the frame, um, is running uh, hosted by Instructure for us. We have a, you know, a contract with them. They basically run it for us. And then inside, in an iframe, we have the edX content. In our case, we are running that uh, in-house. We have our own open edX instance. But this functionality has also been turned on an edge. I know that's what UBC are using. Um, but basically, the, the key thing here is that we're not actually exporting and importing content anywhere. This is a live Canvas instance that's embedding content from a live edX instance. And so that kind of simplifies. We don't have to deal with file formats and so on. If it runs on edX, we can run it in Canvas. So it's a quick overview of basically how we get here. Um, there's two halves. There's the LTI provider and the LTI consumer. The provider in this case is edX. And so running your own open edX instance to do this, it's reasonably straightforward now. You turn on the LTI feature flag. Um, I don't remember offhand what it is, but it's in the documentation. Um, and that basically adds a new Django application to the, uh, the edX stack uh, that hooks into all the rest of the, uh, the code there. Once it's up and running, you then have to create a consumer record for every consumer that's going to connect. So in our case, we have uh, one LTI consumer record per class that's running uh, using this content. And that's really just a best practice thing. It's not necessary. You could have, we could have just one record in our system that points to our Canvas instance. Um, we're using separate LTI key value pairs just uh, for bookkeeping purposes. But basically, that gives, uh, when we create that, we create a, an OAuth key value pair that is used to sign the LTI messages that go back and forth between edX and Canvas. 
And then the last part is, um, it's a little bit awkward, but this is basically a, a big simplification on our part. Um, we are saying that any course that's being launched over LTI shouldn't have regular edX users uh, dabbling in it. We should basically be using a, a separate instance of a course for, uh, for LTI purposes. In our case, that's very simple because we're just pulling stuff off edX.org, loading it up onto our internal instance. In others, you'd have to clone the course uh, on edX.org, or I'm sorry, on Edge. Um, there's no great reason for this apart from the fact that it made the, the implementation far, far easier. So that's on the provider side. Coming over to the consumers, so in our case, this is Canvas and others, it's Blackboard. Um, you install the edX uh, LTI provider in your uh, your campus LMS system, and there's instructions all over the internet of how to do that. Uh, the next part is really kind of nasty, and when I come to the future work section, this is really the part that we need to, to work most on. And this is every piece of edX content can be uniquely addressed and basically added as an LTI uh, component. But in order to address it, you have to construct the URL yourself, and that's kind of unpleasant. Basically, it's a edX slash LTI slash the course key slash the uh, usage ID, so the you know the key for the content, and those are tricky to get a hold of. Personally, I used to go through and inspect source. I've kind of come up with better ways of doing it since then, but um, basically you have to build that up. So that's something that we're looking to improve at some point. But the key thing here is that we can address the content at basically all levels of the hierarchy. We can do the section which uh, um, has the the film strip across the top with all the various pages you can go to. We can zoom in to the subsection, which is just the the list, uh, the, the single page with multiple items on it, or we can zoom right into a single unit, so that's either a single video or a single problem. Um, and we're actually using various levels in various different courses, depending on what the, the faculty are looking for. Um, so that's how we're setting things up. The next part um, is the uh, the identity. So basically, we have two discrete systems here. We have uh, Canvas on campus, and we have our Open edX instance. One of our major goals here was to make this as transparent as possible for our students. In fact, most of the time, our students don't know that they're using a separate system. They think everything's just coming through Canvas. Um, and so the way we do this is we tie into the fact that an LTI launch carries with it a kind of single sign-on token for that user. Um, when you send the, the LTI launch message from Canvas, in our case, um, it includes a uh, user ID, which is guaranteed by the LTI spec not to change. So every time a single user makes a launch, that same ID comes across. Um, what we're doing is the first time somebody launches, we look up in our database, see if we've seen this LTI ID before. If we haven't, we create a new account for that user. Um, and then subsequently, whenever they come back, we recognize we've created an account and we just basically transparently log that user in. Um, so. You can see here a completely white screen. Um, if you could see the details on it, you would see that up in the, the top corner here, where normally you would see your username, there's a string of random characters, 30 of them to be precise. And this is because we are creating a username that we never expect the, the, the user to actually use. Um, in fact, if the user sees their edX dashboard, something's gone wrong. Um, although we kind of assume that they will, which is why you don't see anything here, because we've restricted access on all of our courses. Um, but basically, every time the same user comes back, they get this same random username. If they happen to find their way to openedx.harvard, then this is all they're going to see. There's nothing they can do except log out, which is fine. Next time they come back, they'll log in again. So that's basically how we're managing users. Um, this is quite different from uh, the way that, for instance, a single sign-on works, where we're looking to preserve, no, they're looking to kind of preserve meaningful identities between the two systems. We only really care about the system, the, the Canvas identity, and then we kind of uh, generate and we, we make do on the edX side. Um, so we're running a little short in time, so the last topic I want to cover here is assignments. So we've seen already that we can launch content. We have the Canvas frame, edX content in the middle, and everything's good. Um, the one, one nice thing we get out of LTI is that it's actually a two-way process. You launch a tool from the consumer and the, producer, or the um, provider creates the content, but the provider can also optionally pass back a grade to the consumer. So if you think about a, a, an edX assignment, you do your work, you press the check button, 
and then you've either got the point or you haven't, or you've got a reflection of points or you haven't. Um, what LTI lets us do is it lets us pass back just a single number between 0 and 1. And so if you've got 3 out of 4, then that number is 0 0.75. Um, on the LMS side, uh, the, the campus LMS side, it can then scale that into, is that a C or at Harvard an A? Um, is it, you know, is it pass fail? Is it 75% total? Um, initially, this is the one part that we actually went beyond where we'd originally planned. We originally said we were only going to do grade pass back for single units because technically speaking, that was an order of magnitude easier than doing it for composite units. Over time, we kind of figured, you know, we're in the code now anyway, we may as well. And so we've extended it so that um, you can actually pass back a grade from any level of granularity although that didn't make it into Cyprus. So we're going to have to wait for the next release for that. But basically, here's the workflow. Um, we have the, uh, just make out the, the pointing on the picture exercise from the demo course. Um, it shows up inside our Canvas interface. You answer the question, in this case, you answer it wrongly, so you get an X. Uh, and then you go back to your gradebook in the Canvas system, and it's now showing that you have an, an updated grade, an updated score. Uh, in this case, it's the second bottom one. You get a zero out of one, and so that's basically your grade coming back from edX. In terms of retries and so on for the questions, that's all governed on the edX side. So you can set up your edX problem to allow two or three attempts, or as many attempts as you want, or however you, you would normally set up your content. Um, so that's easy for the, um, the single unit case. In the multiple units, so when you have a, a vertical that has several units, one, or several questions one after another, it's a little trickier because edX basically doesn't have the concept of a problem set. Every problem stands alone, and it has its own check button, and it has its own score, and so on. If you have, like, a, think about a, a problem set or an exam, you'd have a whole list of questions that you want to think of as, as a unit. And so we had this issue where you would answer one out of five questions, you get it right, uh, edX would send a message to Canvas saying this person got 20% of the overall assignment. Uh, Canvas would say, that's great, that's an F. It would email the student and say, congratulations, you failed this exam. And then the student would freak out. So what we've done instead is we've built in uh, a delay. Um, so when you answer a question, if there are more, more than one question on a page, it waits for 15 minutes. And that 15 minutes is just a kind of arbitrary number that we came up with. I've been told that it's both too long and too short. Um, so it can be tweaked at the, the installation level. Um, but what that does is it kind of holds off a little bit to see if you're going to answer another question before it sends that result. Um, so that's where we are just now. Uh, the only question left is you know, what comes next. The biggest uh, problem we have right now is the, the authoring system. It's kind of a pain to construct these URLs. What we're doing at Harvard is we actually have our own tool that lets you drag and drop content from you know, this is edX, this is Canvas, it just installs it for you. Um, anyone using Canvas, come talk to me, that tool is widely available. Anyone using Blackboard, come talk to me and we'll talk about porting it. Um, but that's kind of an easier way to do the, uh, the integration. Um, we're also, we're not limiting enrollments in courses right now. Uh, we're kind of trusting the Canvas site to take care of that. And like I said before, we're assuming that every course to use with L uh, LTI is going to be its own course. So there's some room for improvement. We're kind of waiting for a feedback in our demo, to our, our pilot, to see what's actually going to be useful. Um, there's already some work underway. There's the people at UBC are starting to put together a, a more interesting user management model rather than just create an anonymous user and log somebody else out. Um, but the big story is that in both campuses, we've not heard any issues yet with the pilots. So we're taking that as a, as a very strong positive. So we know that it works. I think that's us out of time. Do we have time for questions, or should we just make ourselves available afterwards?